The Lord be with you. With Reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. At that time, lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be consecrated in the truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one. What is the link you can make, if any, between the three readings of today? First reading from the Acts of Apostles. Second reading from the first letter of St. John. And the Gospel. We have just heard. John chapter 17. The second part of the Jesus' priestly prayer. Question two. Are there ingredients that could transform any gathering of people at all into a Christian community? If there are such ingredients, what are they? Question three. What role are you playing now? What role or rules? Are you playing now? And what do you plan to do in case you have been just procrastinating? What role are you playing? And what, or what do you plan to do? A, towards making this chaplaincy, Bookstera chaplaincy, towards making it a true Christian community. We are not yet a true Christian community. We desire to be. And I have constantly spoken about how we could become a true Christian community. Everyone has a role to play. The priest alone cannot do that. Everyone has a role to play in transforming this community to a true Christian community like the early church was. Okay? What role are you playing toward that? And B, towards the spiritual transformation of each and every member of Luke's terror chaplaincy for Christ. Question four. What are some of the implications of Jesus' saying that we, his followers, are, quote, in the world, but not of the world? He says, they are not of the world, and that is why the world hates them. He says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So, but he says, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, meaning we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Now, what are the implications of that saying of Jesus, that we are in the world, 
and not of the world, as we live through, as we struggle through today's precarious Nigerian situation? Please reflect on this question before you answer. And, um, and I would like some serious good answers for that. Yes, I can hear. I want to answer question two. Yes. There are ingredients that can transform any gathering of people into a Christian community. Such as? So the first ingredient is belief in Christ. Belief in Christ. Because you can have a classroom full of people, but for it to be a Christian community, it has to be belief in Christ. Believe, just believe in Christ? No. What, is, what was emphasized in today's uh, first reading? In, today, in the risen Lord. In the believe reason. in Christ as the one who died and, and rose again. From the dead. Yes. There are other people who believe in Christ, as you know. The Muslims believe in Christ, but not as the son of as Christ. God. And, and, and we, we Christians, the distinguishing factor is that we believe in Christ, not just as a prophet, because the there are other people God. who believe that Jesus is a prophet, but that he is Lord and God, and that he yes. is risen from the dead. Yes. yes. And another ingredient is Christian sharing. Another ingredient is love. Christian love that was emphasized in today's uh, second, second reading. Second reading. And the last ingredient is Christian fellowship. That's the same. There's one other in ingredient. Love yes. and fellowship. It is, it is love that makes them do fellowship. There's one more ingredient. Trust. Is anybody ready to help her? To give her one more ingredient. She has mentioned faith in the risen Lord. Love and fellowship. Yes. Prayer. What about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit? Prayer, the, prayer has a very important place. But according to the, in the readings of today, the three things are actually faith in God, in Christ, love, love. that binds us together, and the Spirit, Spirit that enables us all that. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> yes, wait a minute. Is that, that's the question I wanted to ask. Yes, uh, Perpetua. Next to it. Let me attempt question three. This question is like, it's thrown to me personally. Uh -huh. Yes. Because the first day I stepped into this chaplaincy, I said, this is the place to be. Um, and since then, what I'm doing now is to make the life of Christ um, lifestyle, you know, the values of this chaplaincy a lifestyle. Not Make the values of the chaplaincy a lifestyle. Yes. Because I cannot give what I don't have. And um, with the trends of events now, everywhere is shocked up. No time for much evangelism or whatever. But if I can make this life, I f believe so many will look at me and get converted. So many will look at you and yes, then get transformed themselves. So I've been trying to involve this, um, this lives into my business, into my family, into anywhere in my community. For instance, the social media is where I belong. Anytime I see things going on wrong, I bring in one of our, our values, bringing people together, love. And since Sunday, since last Sunday, the scripture has been telling us about love, love, love. And the one that hits me was that of yesterday, before, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, where he said that Jesus has loved us. Now I was asking myself, if God in my dirtiness, in my everything, in my wrongdoings, he lost me. What then will I give back? It's high time I imbibe in the um, values of 
um, Luke Sarah chaplaincy. And if I can do it, if I'll be able to do it, honestly, I believe I have the faith that it will draw many to Christ. That's what I'm doing now and now. And I'll continue to do it. So, and, with what you are doing, how does it make Bishop a better Christian? How does it make Neka a better Christian? If, if Bishop sees me in a, a, maybe my life, he will be happy because I know that Bishop is one of the pillars of this chaplain. Oh, he's a pillar. <laughs> <laughs> pillar, okay. <laughs> he, will, he will be happy and he will be encouraged. He will say, okay, so what we are doing? Thank God they didn't call him a cornerstone. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something, Father. Now it's hardly for me to beat the traffic. If I do it, I'll continue to you know, feel bad even when I get home. Uh -huh. it, before, it was not like that. In fact, there was a day I bet a there's one kind of driving I made. Nobody talked to me, but I felt so bad. To the point that any little thing, my mind still go are there, are there still people here who beat traffic light? You are, you are shaking head for Sometimes. everybody. How can you shake head for everybody? So, where, where I work to, sometimes there are challenges. But I look at the value of this um, chaplaincy. I'll say it's like I'm drilling. Uh, do you have the, those values? The values, because the values of the friends are value of chaplaincy. Yes, finish, and I'll ask you to so read those values. So that is, that is actually what I'm, I want it, I want those things to be in my lifestyle, that I don't struggle with them again. I will live and live into them. Thank you, Father. Give her a round of applause. Uh, Bishop, do you have those values? Uh -huh, just some, give us a summary. So um, the values, some of them that uh, readily come to mind are Christian love, the fear of God, um, generosity, gratitude, um, humility, honesty, integrity, um, sorry, self-control, civic punctuality, integrity, punctuality, punctuality, and, and civic discipline. integrity. Yes, yeah, civic integrity as well. Yeah. Those so are the the civic that integrity means that you... Um, you are a good citizen. You pay all just taxes. You obey traffic regulations. You do what you are, said, you are supposed to do as a good citizen. In addition to Christian love, generosity and kindness and so on and so forth. These are the values of Luke Terra that Perpetua is talking about. Another round of applause for her. Okay. Yes, uh, Zubike. But I want to attempt question four. Okay. The implications of Jesus saying that we, his followers, are in the world, but not in the world, but not of the world. But at the cornerstone of the Christian faith is following the examples of Jesus Christ. To live the Christian life means following the example of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Yes. The more Christ-like we are, the more this world will hate us. Why? Why will the world hate us the more Christ-like we are? Father, the world is broken. The world is unbelieving. And this is the warning that Jesus Christ is giving to the disciples and to us. That if we get attached to this world, we may not make Heaven. If we get attached to this world, the world will love us. The world will love us. And, and we're going to build that world separating us from Jesus Christ. Because they also hated Jesus Christ. Just he, as he, they hated Jesus Christ, yes, if we are living us. the life of Jesus, they will hate yes. us. He's also asking us to influence the world and not get tainted by the world. Okay. Now, you are in the world, you are not of the world. Are there other implications you can give us? You are not in the world. No, you are in the world. Yeah, no, no, okay. We are in the world. Yes. We certainly are in the world. Ah. 
And even he was asking Father not to take us away from this so world. So we are solidly we are in the here, world. But not was, of the world. Yeah, not of the world. He's asking that he should not take us away because he knows the implication that this world is broken. This world is fallen. We are to make the best of this world in the circumstances and the challenges of this world. We are called to walk towards making heaven. We are called toward living the life of Jesus Christ as believers. Love has a, a role to play, Father. We, we, I mean, from last week's theme, it was all about love and love and love. And today, added unity, unity of the church. Yes. Give this a call. Seven, okay. 60 Helene, or 70. Helene can finish. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. Well, Helene, help. Uh, Amichi, you don't have an answer to any of these. Father, I want to add that when you are in the world, the values are, that guide you are things like prestige, uh, you want to be famous, popular, power, and so on. And to be in the world, there are values that reign, that are yes. trendy in the world. Yes. And they are the ones that actually lead us into trouble. Yes. And human beings are born with those values. With those, we are born and we are socialized with those values. Popularity. To be popular. To be a celebrity. Yes. Uh, if you go to young people, teenagers, and young adults, what is most important is celebrity status. But that is what can lead people very easily into trouble. Next, riches. Riches to have all the wealth in the world. And then, pleasure. Those are called the concupiscence, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. They are the ones that lead human beings down. And yet, they are the ones human beings are socialized into wanting. From the day we were born, from the day we were born, we are cultured into seeking these things. If we are to be acceptable to our families, if our families are to honor us and give us the chieftaincy title of our grandfather and so on and so forth, it is that we are having, we are pursuing these things and we are having a lot of them. Yet, that is what it means to be in the world. But Jesus Christ says we are not of the world. Oh. Meaning those are not to be our priorities. And right. one thing, especially in Nigeria, is the, not the truth. We are not guided by the truth. And Jesus talked about the truth. So if you want to be popular in Nigeria, you tell lies. People clap for you. Even in churches, we go and then people say things. And because we are not guided, we are afraid people will reject us. So we follow the path of lies and so on. Then to, not to be of the world is to be guided by the kingdom values. Kingdom values are, you know, prayer. You have to pray for each other, love one another, care for one another, empathize. And speak to the truth at all time. Don't look at the cause of speaking the truth. It may land you in jail, but speak to the truth and the Lord will be with you. And believe that despite all the persecutions you go through, that as long as you're in the world, they go through persecution, the God is with you through all this. He's walking along with you and you have faith in God. So you do things and others laugh at you. Why are you doing that? You are doing it for God and not for the world. There is a speaker on TED, I think, and she's a writer also. Her name is Christine Carter. You can Google it. Christine Carter, uh, like Jimmy Carter. And she gave an address on truth. And the fact that people do not understand that the key source of happiness and the reason why many people are not happy or fulfilled in life is that many people are living a lie and many people tell lies. And that as long as we are not living the truth, we cannot be happy. He says, she says because there is something in us that when we are lying, our adrenal glands begin to secrete. And, and then she, she discusses the fact that the, what is the lie detect, detector? Many of you know that there's something called lie detector. 
that the, all the lie detector does is measure the glands in the body that if you are telling lies, the stress hormones are released in, in, in quantities. And because of that, if your stress hormones are constantly rising high, what happens? Your system begins to collapse one after the other. You begin to get ill. You can't be happy if you are not. And then it says, unfortunately, most human beings live through their lives living a lie. Please, I want you to watch it because at the end of the day, halfway through the discussion, she removed her shoe. And she said, even me, I am living a lie with my high heels. And she removed it. And for the rest of the talk, she was walking on the stage without shoes. Because she said, these high heels, I am telling a lie. It is giving the impression that I have a particular gait that I don't have. It is giving the impression that I have a certain height that I don't have. This is a lie. <clears throat> and she says, and she says that everybody who wears the high heels knows that it is not so comfortable, but that they are struggling with it, living a lie that it is okay. And he says that most of us live lie. Don't look at somebody's shoes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, Christine Carter, please Google it and watch it. It is absolutely important for us to raise children to tell the truth. Because if we live a lie, we will neither be healthy nor happy. What did I say? If we live a lie, we will neither be healthy nor happy. And that, and that the, the real source of happiness is living a life that is consistent with the truth. Living, the, living your truth. The truth of who you are. Live it out and you will be a happy person. Have we finished answering? Number one. And so, Father, um, I'd like to attend question one. The link between the three readings of today, if there is any, I think there is a link. Ah, tell us. And this link to me is the Christian love, the love of God. If you look through the, the readings, starting from first reading, uh, when they were talking about replacement. Replacing Judas with Judas Matthias. With Matthias. And, um, and everything that played out there, one, they allowed themselves in their best form. They went into prayers. Ask truly. For so they were united in praying yes. for God's choice. Yes. Uh, and uh, to me, it does love for one another and Christian love in his best form. They could have easily decided that the head of the disciples who pick, or they may use their human minds to choose who had done best to replace that. But they came together. There is power in coming together among brethren. They even prayed okay. and got that. Now, all through the reading, you will see, even when they were talking about, even in the last reading, when he's, they were praying, they said, Christ said, Father, do not, um, how did they put it again? Do hmm? not take them out of the world. Yeah, do not take them out of the world. Now, everything there was going about, talking about love, your neighbor as you love yourself as Christ had loved the church. So you believe the link is love. Definitely the second reading is very clear on the love. Mm. Uh, the gospel, yes, alludes to it. The love between the father and the son yes. which he shares with the, his followers. Now the first reading about the choice of Matthias. Um, okay. They were together in fellowship. It is love that bound them together. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> and then question number four. Yes, 
you tried in that answer the question number four, you are in the world but not of the world. It has many, many implications for us. I just tried to mention the concupiscence, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. I tried to mention the fact that the cravings of human beings the elements with which we were socialized, by socialized I mean we were nurtured. The way we nurture children, we nurture children to desire the very things that root us in the world, that make us off the world. Do you understand that? The very things that Jesus is talking against when he says you are in the world, not of the world. What society does, what our families do, is to initiate us into those things, to make us love those things that rivet us in the world. How many people understand that? Society teaches us that your life is a failure if you go through and go to school like others and you don't become a big man with big car, with big house, with big house in Lagos, in the village, and so on. So society teaches you that you are a failure. And so what do people do? In order to be accepted, because acceptance is so important for human beings. Human beings don't just want to flourish, they want to be accepted. They want to be applauded. Because of that, people now do all kinds of things, including criminal things, in order to be accepted. Human beings want to be celebrated, so people want to become celebrities. I told you how I went to a school and say, what do you want to be? They say, I want to be celebrity. And I say, celebrity in what? They say, celebrity in anything. I just, and I say, look, to be popular is different from to be notorious. A lot of people we are seeing calling celebrities today are actually notorious. Not, I won't call them popular, but what? notorious. There are notorious criminals. There are some kind of celebrity. There are people who are doing all kinds of shameful things today that we call celebrities. And they are making money. They are making money and making a name. And having millions of people follow them on social media. And they are making money from that one too. For doing what? Terrible things. But that's the way of the world. The way of the world is the way of riches and plenty of riches. The way of pleasure and plenty of pleasure. We were here the other Sunday, was it last Sunday, the Sunday before, talking about um, somebody whose wife or whose husband leaves her or him after five years of marriage and so on. What does the person do? And I said, if you are a Catholic, there is something called Catholic marriage. Go and find out in the world. It's an expression. It's an idiom to say a Catholic marriage. What does it mean? A Catholic marriage is permanent. And no excuses. If it's a well-constituted marriage, it is permanent. Uh, but what if this person does this? This person does this? Well, what does it mean to say for better or worse in good times and in bad? What does that mean? I am one of those who believe that there has to be certain immutable truths. Certain truths that don't change with time and with circumstance. Catholic morality is not built on, built on what they call situation ethics. Under social situation, then a different set of truths apply. Under this situation, no. No, there are certain, there may be a few, but there are certain truths that are absolute and immutable, meaning they don't change. We are getting into a generation where everything, everything is changing. Everything. And I do not believe that the world will find happiness that way. And if the Lord says you are in the world, you are not of the world, every one of us needs to keep asking ourselves, what are the implications of this for my choices today? For the choices I make today. What are the implications for my business? And my business transaction? I mean, 
We're in a country where you can hardly get anything straight through the right door. Hardly anything through the right door. What does it mean under those circumstances that you are in the world, you are not of the world? Right? In a country where you can hardly get anything through the right door, what does it mean that you are in the world, you are not of the world? In a country where there is so much failure, uh, we have just mentioned marriage, failure in marriage, marital relationships, what does it mean that you are in the world, you are not of the world? In a country where there is so much tribalism, uh, the ethnic uh, the, the bigotry, where there is group, hate, group, talk about group prejudice, you have this prejudice against this person simply because of an experience that your grandfather or father told you of with her people or his people. I mean, I, I meet people who grew up in Lagos. The two people were born and bred in Lagos. Attended, like Bishi attended King's College or St. Gregory's or whatever. And then when politics comes, they begin to talk of one another as Shikli and, and Jukun and Fulani and so on and so forth. So you mean our being born in one place and being raised in that place, no impact. No impact whatsoever. What does it mean under that circumstance that you are in the world, but you are not of the world? What it means is that in everything, in every circumstance, particular circumstance, we have to distinguish ourselves and say, I am in the world, but I am not of the world. The values of the world are often in contradistinction with the values of the kingdom. And we have to be aware of that in the choices that we make on a daily basis. And I must warn you that it is costly. It is costly. You cannot live the Christian life without cost. It is not possible. This is why Jesus Christ prayed. That prayer, 26 verses of John chapter 17, Jesus was praying passionately for us that the evil one should not be able to take us away. And the way the evil one is taking Christians away is the evil one is making Christians to be in the world and of the world, to embrace the values of the world, to be riveted to the world and what works in the world. A lot of what works in the world are against the values of the kingdom. Please be aware of this. And let it not shock you when you begin to suffer. He says that the world hates them because the world hated me. So each time you say, oh, why me, why me, why am I, why? Who told you that to follow Jesus Christ, you will have pleasure all the time, everywhere in the world? In fact, the opposite is the case, unless the nonsense that is going on among many preachers who keep preaching prosperity all the time and not speaking the truth. The truth is what Jesus Christ has told us. If you are of the world, the world will love you and you will prosper very much in the world. If you are of the world. But because you are not of the world, the world hates you. And the world did not hate you first. Whom did the world hate first? Jesus Christ. We need to have that in mind very, very clearly. And because we are not united in this idea, this is the weakness of Christians. Do you understand? Our greatest weakness is that we are not united in the most central idea of Christianity, which is the cross. We are not united. We are divided. And Jesus prayed and prayed that they may be one. Because Jesus knows that the enemy within is worse than the enemy from outside. Our disunity is worse than the persecution we suffer from outside. It is easy to identify the enemy from outside, but it is often more difficult for us to recognize the enemy within, our disunity, our lack of agreement. Did Jesus Christ not say in Matthew 18, 19, if two of you agree, right, to ask for anything, are we often agreed? No. Because we are not agreed, because we are not one, we are not united, then it is easy 
for the evil one to infiltrate and destroy the sheep of Christ. Please reflect on that question number four. Even as we finish today, ref keep reflecting on it. What are the implications for you and for your family and for your working place of being in the world and not of the world? And let me mention something about question number three. Thank you for uh, Ifoma and uh, who else answered uh, question number three. But what I really wanted was I have been speaking about our covenant relationship in this church. I have been speaking of the fact that mass Christianity doesn't seem to be working in this country. That we need greater commitment to a worshipping community. And as I'm going to say later, later, the idea of solitary Christians doesn't exist. There is no such thing as me, myself, and my God. It doesn't exist. You need a community with whom you are related. A community to, whom, to which you are bound a community that is helping to nurture you and you are helping to nurture them. You need that kind of community. And my question is, what role are you playing? And I keep emphasizing that no one should belong to this chaplaincy that is just a floor member. Tony is a cameraman. That's the role he's playing. Inya is choir mistress. That's the role. The Bethesda is an organist. That's the role he's playing. Uh, um, Mrs. Mwachuko is a Eucharistic minister. What are you doing? Do you understand what I'm saying? There's got to be something, a role you play. That when you wake up to go to church, you are going to perform this role apart from just, I'm going to pray to God. When you are coming to church, it has to be that you have, and I want everyone here, 100 or how many, however many you are, that each one of you has a role. Emmanuel is a catechist. So he comes here yesterday evening, he was here with the catechism, catechism of parents and children. He goes to perform a role. What role are you performing in this chaplaincy? Please think about it. Christians don't grow by just being a member of the, of the crowd. No Christian grows that way. Mark my words. Christians don't grow by just being a member of the crowd. No. That's why I keep saying that there are no backbenchers in God's house. It's not possible. You've got to have a role that you play. The former told us the role she plays among the women. Every one of us has to have a ministry. We've got to have something that we are committed to in the community of Christ. That's the only way we can grow. That's the only way we can grow. And that's, the, that's what that question was about. What role are you playing now? What plans do you have if you are not playing the role now? towards making this place a true Christian community? And what role are you playing now or what do you plan to do so that each person, not just yourself, become transformed for Christ, but that each person here gets transformed for Christ? Is there something you can do? I don't have all the ideas. And some of the ideas will be in your heads. What can you do? What can you contribute for the transformation of Cecilia, for the transformation of... Uh, uh, Latifat, for the transformation of Henry, for the transformation of what can you do? And there are things you can do. Just spend time before the Lord and reflect on it and ask the Lord. As Isaiah said in chapter 6, here I am, send me. And he will show you what it is you can do. May the Lord bless you. Jesus prayed that they may be one. That we may remain in the truth. Absolutely important to remain in the truth. That we may be protected from the evil one. He prayed that we may be one. He prayed that we may abide in the truth and that we may be protected from the evil one. We have often heard several accusations against the church by Christians. Actually, Christians, when you see social media, Christians are the ones that blast Christianity more than any other uh, the church has not done this or done that. The church has done this or not that. The church is too this or too that. The church is failing in this or that. And my, always, my response, as you know here, my response is always, who is the church? Bring that church. Let me give him 10 strokes of the cane. Who is that church that is doing so, such terrible things? And you, the accuser, 
Do you not consider yourself a key member of the church? Because whenever people say the church, the church, what it means is that they don't consider that they are a pillar like Bishop. <laughs> because if they consider themselves as one of the stones that make up the church, if they consider that they are one of the whatever segments of the church, then they will not say the church in third, in third person. The church, as if you are talking of uh, the, those people. And you are a Christian and you speak like that. Can you listen to yourself? You are speaking of your family as them, them, they. they. Second Vatican Council defines the church as what? The people of God. Again, what does it say? The church is the people of God. Do you consider yourself among the people of God? Then you are the church. The church, we are a communion. And what does a communion mean? Common union of hearts and soul. We are a community. What does community mean? Common unity of individuals and groups. We are a fellowship, a brotherhood of what? Of people from diverse background. Actually, if we were not from diverse backgrounds, then we may not qualify to be Catholic Church. The concept of Catholic, which we say in our creed, I believe in the Apostolic and Catholic and Apostolic Church, it means that church that came from the apostles, that is universal. Catholic is another word for universal. That come from everywhere. If we were not diverse, then it's, it, may, it may just be a household church. Yes, we are a fellowship, a brotherhood. People from different backgrounds that have become brothers and sisters. We are a body, a living organism with many parts. We are a family, meaning we are linked by blood. By whose blood? The blood of Jesus. We are a kinship of brothers and sisters and parents and children. The blood of Jesus has made us brothers and sisters. We are a church, a gathering of believers in Jesus. In this communion, in this community, this fellowship, this body, this family, this church, everyone has an indispensable role. This is the point I was making. Everyone has a role. Let no one just follow them to church. I don't want anybody to just follow somebody to church. We are all firstborn sons and firstborn daughters. Ada, Avi? First daughter is Ada. What is first son? Okwara. Uh -huh. We are all Okwara and Ada in God's church. In God's church, no one is a last born. No. We are all first born in God's church. We all have a stake. If there is a family meeting, we are all seated like what? Firstborn sons and daughters. So don't consider yourself. I mean, there are people who pride themselves. Me, I'm a backbencher. Me, I'm a backbencher. Get out of the church. You don't belong in a church if you are a backbencher. You don't belong. It's okay for somebody who is just coming in and who, like chicken, who, who that has just entered the place that holds one leg to watch first. As I am, Nichi was watching first. <clears throat> But after a few weeks, after a few months, can you continue to be a backbencher? No. You are either ready to be part of the community and take your place and play your role or get out of the place. I keep saying that we have all been deceived. We have been under this illusion of crowd. Crowd. Everywhere crowd. And we deceive ourselves that we are Christians with those crowds. No. Jesus is looking for committed Followers, people who can say with St. Peter, to whom shall we go? We know that you have the word of eternal life. To whom shall we go? We are stuck with you. We are here. We will sink or swim with you. That is the kind of followership Jesus needs. And I keep saying to you, and I said it last Sunday, that look, 
in the 21st century that has just come, with all the changes we had in the 20th century that has come into 21st century, Christianity as we know it will not survive in this form, in this lackadaisical, wishy-washy form. Christianity will survive in the hearts and minds and communities of people who are really committed. And they may be few. They will be few. That's why Jesus calls us the, the salt of the earth, the light of the world. But we keep thinking that it is only when the whole towns are, well, whole towns are Christian, but, well, Christian, so what? No impact, right? No impact. What impact are we really making? What impact have we made in this country? Twelve people, twelve disciples of Jesus Christ went around and they transformed the ancient world. They transformed the ancient world. Twelve people. <clears throat> so, Jesus did not need the 5,000 people that he fed. If you are looking for miracle, if you are looking for miracle extravaganza, gather 10,000 people. But if you are looking for faithful witnesses of the gospel, gather 12 people. You can quote me. Because the 5,000 people that came and ate bread with Jesus, where were they when it mattered? If you are looking for miracle, gather thousands of people. But I say if you are looking for faithful witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the type that, look at what happened when they were choosing uh, Matthias. Did they say the person who witnessed the miracles of Jesus? No, the person who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. It is very important. Thousands of people who can come and enjoy miracles. But they are, that's not evidence of Christian witnessing. Christian witnessing has to do with witnessing to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is not a joke. It is costly. Everyone must contribute his or her gift and talent and time and resources towards the well-being and growth and development of the church. There is no room in God's church for backbenchers or passive onlookers, for anonymous members, for armchair critics. Our coming together is what makes us church. Our coming together with our various talents from our various backgrounds, with our readiness to contribute our various talents, that is what makes us church. Jesus teaches that God saves us not just as individuals but as a community. So there is no such thing as a solitary Christian. I have been saying this at infinitum. No such thing as a solitary Christian. How we relate to each other is part of how we relate to God. Jesus teaches that the two commandments of love God and love of neighbor can never be separated. Loving one's neighbor is not an abstract thing. It means involving ourselves concretely in a historical worshiping community. Now listen, everybody needs to hear this, to take it seriously. There are many people who say the church is bad, and then, but I am a good Christian. I believe my Christian, you are not a Christian, my friend, because a Christian has to be a Christian in community, in a particular community. There is no provision for, uh, Christianity is not an ideology that you hold in your head at home. Christianity is life that you live with others. So there's no provision for solitary Christian. You've got to be a Christian in an active, vibrant community. Look at Acts of Apostles chapter 2 and chapter 4. Look at how they lived. In a historical worshiping community with the good, the bad, and the ugly. One can only love the invisible God if one immerses oneself in the real community on earth, loving the neighbor that one can see. As John says, you cannot say you love God that you cannot see when you do not love your neighbor that you can see. Our age tends to separate spirituality from community. We practice. I mean, Eastern religions have that kind of practice. You practice your spirituality alone in your room. No, that's not Christian. That's why we need to have our identity and recognize who we are. We are not one of those Eastern religions that you practice your, 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 your religion in your house, in your room, and whatever. No, no, no. Our religion, you do some. Of course, you pray at home. But coming together and proclaiming Christ's reason together. Witnessing him to, together with, with, to him together is absolutely important. Yes, we tend to divorce spirituality from community. We often want God, but it, we don't want the church. 
Yet, active involvement in a church or in a community of faith is non-negotiable. It is a non-negotiable element of the Christian life. Individuals attempting to find or serve God while neglecting the community of God's children. And I insist, the community of God's children, including the good, the bad, and the ugly. Such individuals are living unconfronted lives. You are living in an illusion. Only in community can we practice the Christian virtues of sacrificial love. Can you do sacrificial love when you are alone in your room? Can you, can you do forgiveness when you are alone in your room? Can you do humility in your room when you don't relate with anyone? Is it, is it not in relationship that you practice humility? Is it not in relationship you practice generosity? Sacrificial love, is it not in relationship? Then leave me alone. Leave me. I don't want anybody to bother me. I just want to make my heaven myself. You, you won't make heaven. The incarnation, God taking flesh, has some harsh consequences for spirituality and community. The body of Christ means not just the body of the historical Jesus, but his real presence in the Eucharist. You see, if we who celebrate the Eucharist really know what, really appreciate what this body of Christ means. Christ has united himself to his church. St. Paul says he is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Christ has so united himself with the church that you cannot have Jesus Christ and reject his bride. Can you? No. You can't have Jesus Christ and reject his bride. Now, the bride may be ugly, as it's often ugly. The bride may have all kinds of problems, but you can't have Jesus and reject his bride. So when you say body of Christ, yes, it's the body of Jesus, we believe, but it also has implications for the body of people sitting down. It is also the concrete historical body of believers on earth. That's part of the body of Christ. We are part of the body of Christ. The faithful housewife as well as the adulterous husband. The honest artisan as well as the fraudulent trader. The exemplary politician as well as the corrupt official. The saintly nun as well as the dubious priest. We are all what? Body of Christ, unfortunately. Right? We are all body of Christ. The body of Christ is made up of these saints and sinners. And yet Jesus says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood. These are serious implications for all of us. Serious implications. You cannot relate with a perfect, all-loving, all-forgiving God in heaven if you cannot deal with a less than perfect, less than loving, less than forgiving community here on earth. Please, after Mass, you can ask me if there are challenges you have here, and I know you have challenges. Ask me so that we discuss it more seriously. You cannot pretend to be worshipping an invisible God in heaven if you refuse to deal with the visible family here on earth, the good, the bad, and the ugly. To say that you love the God you cannot see when you are unwilling to love the neighbor you can see here on earth, St. John says, is a lie. Community is a constitutive part of the very essence of Christianity. Without concrete involvement in a church, what we have is nothing but private fantasy. Without concrete involvement, there are people who have been coming here for five years, but they have never been involved. I don't even know their names. And the reason why I don't know their names is that they are not actively involved in anything. Those who are actively involved in things, I know their names by the grace of God. Without concrete involvement in a, in a church, what we have is nothing but private fantasy, but not a genuine Christian faith. Read the Gospels. When St. Thomas separated himself from the community, you remember what happened? When he separated himself from the community, he suffered. He suffered pain for longer than the other people suffered pain because he cut himself off from the community. When he reunited with the community, what happened? Jesus showed himself to him. Jesus decided not to show himself to Thomas until Thomas rejoined the community. Real conversion demands active involvement in the mock and the grace of actual church life. Real conversion. The search for God is not a private search. I think 
I have emphasized this enough now. The search for God is not a private search. It is a communal search. There is no solitary Christian, I say. Christian spirituality is clearly communitarian spirituality. As the church anticipates the Feast of Pentecost, we recall that before leaving his disciples to return to the Father, Jesus assured his disciples that he will not leave them as orphans. He promised to send the Holy Spirit to be with them forever. That Holy Spirit that is called the Paraclete, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, as we see in John chapter 14 and John chapter 15, John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, 14, 1 and 14, 15 to 26, but also John chapter 16. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we glorify your holy name. As we prepare for Pentecost, send your spirit to fill the void in our hearts. Send your Holy Spirit to bind us together in your love. Send your Holy Spirit to deliver our country from the mess of the moment. Send your Holy Spirit to heal the wounds in the hearts of many of our countrymen and women. Send your Holy Spirit to enlighten Christians that we may be ready to go out there like the early Christians to give witness to your name with all courage. Through Christ our Lord.